Welcome home, wanderers of the ether. You have found your way to This Week in Amateur Radio, where you can hear all the latest news from the world of amateur radio and communications in general. We are North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air, now celebrating our 23rd year of reporting to you. So let's get things on the air this week as we debut the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1,222 of This Week in Amateur Radio. Russia announces that it's planning to pull out of the International Space Station soon. QST announces it is now offering a column written by and for clubs. The official ARRL Field Day 2022 contacts rise to over 1.2 million. Hams at a Summits on the Air event help prevent a major forest fire. A Chinese booster rocket will be tumbling back to Earth this weekend with a non-zero chance of hitting a populated area. Anatel in Brazil proposes to make use of Logbook of the World mandatory for license upgrades. NASA announces its annual application competition. France announces the takeover of the amateur VHF and UHF radio bands for use during the 2024 Olympic Games. And Norway is now offering APRS mapping service as a motorist resource. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Sitting in for the vacationing Leo Laporte this week is Micah Sargent, who will explain why technology that you may find hard to use is not your fault. Australia's own Otto Benshop, VK6FLAB, will take a long, hard look at our amateur radio community. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of his summer series, Amateur Radio History Headlines. This week, Bill takes us back to read above the fold between 1952 and 1959 in amateur radio history. Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, puts aside his climbing belt to bring you part two of his six-part series on creating a successful public service announcement that promotes your club's ham fest or a special event and get it on the air on local broadcast outlets. And... We will have the concluding part two of a talk given by Alan Thompson, W6WN, on setting up a radio neighborhood watch utilizing the general mobile radio service and repeaters. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in beautiful downtown Albany, New York, where we're looking to get back into the heat wave next week, I'm George W2XBS. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting this week from Cortlandville, New York, in the heart of the Seven Valleys, I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. And reporting from our news bureau in Rochester, New York, Along the southern shore of Lake Ontario, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And reporting from our ham radio station in the heart of the Catskill Mountains of upstate New York, where the log trucks and the milk trucks are rumbling down the road this morning, I'm Don Hewlett, K2ATJ. And reporting from our Troy, New York News Bureau, where all the lawns are beginning to wither, I'm Eric, KD2RJX. And reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where we're getting a break from the hotter-than-you-know-where weather, I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And now with this week's lead story, here is Terry Saunders, N1KIN. Leading off our news this week, BBC News reports that Russia says it will withdraw from the International Space Station after 2024 and build its own station instead. News of a possible broken partnership had observers questioning how the operation of the ISS would continue without Russia's participation. The U.S. and Russia, along with other partners, have successfully worked together on the ISS since 1998. But relations have soured since Russia invaded Ukraine, and Russia previously threatened to quit the project because of Western sanctions against it. NASA said it has not yet received any official notice of Russia's intention to withdraw from the program. The ISS, a joint project involving five space agencies, has been in orbit around Earth since 1998 and has been used to conduct thousands of scientific experiments. 
It is approved to operate until 2024, but the U.S. wants to extend that for six more years with the agreement of all partners. At a meeting with Russia's president, Vladimir Putin, Mr. Borisov said Roscosmos would fulfill its obligation to its partners, but the decision had been taken to quit the project after 2024. I think that by this time, we will start putting together a Russian orbital station, Mr. Borisov said, adding that the new station was this agency's top priority. Good, replied Mr. Putin. It is not immediately clear what the decision means for the future of the ISS, and the U.S. space agency NASA says it has not received any formal notice from Russia of its plans. Former ISS commander and retired U.S. astronaut Dr. Leroy Chow believes it is unlikely Russia will decide to leave the project. I think this is posturing by the Russians. They don't have the money to build their own station, and it would take several years to do it. They've got nothing else if they go this route, he told the BBC. The Russians have been making noises about withdrawal for some time, but it's not clear how serious they are. They've talked about building their own outpost, the Russian Orbital Service Station, but it would require a financial commitment the Russian government has not shown to the country's existing space exploits. Certainly, Russian elements on the ISS are aging, but the view of engineers is that the modules can do a job through to 2030. If Russia does leave, there's no question it would be problematic. The station's designed in a way that makes the partners dependent on each other. The U.S. side of the ISS provides the power. The Russian side provides the propulsion and keeps the platform from falling to Earth. If that propulsive capability is withdrawn, the U.S. and its other partners, Europe, Japan, and Canada, will need to devise other means of periodically boosting the station higher in the sky. It's something American robotic freighters could do. The National Frequency Agency of France, the ANFR, has announced that amateur radio frequency bands are going to be used by official non-ham communications during the 2024 Olympic and Paralympic Games. The 144 and 430 MHz bands will be used for PMR, that's private mobile radio business voice comms. And the 1240 MHz band will be used for PMSE, that's broadcast program making and special events. The 2.3 GHz band will be allocated for professional video links. The National Frequency Agency is in charge of drawing up the frequency plan for the Olympics and allocating the frequencies. To this end, it worked with all the potential stakeholders to assess the amount of spectrum needed for the organisation and the global dissemination of the Games. In this context, bands not primarily devoted to PMR, PMSE audio or video uses, including the scoring and time management systems, have been identified in order to meet the consequent need for spectral resources. This matter had already been discussed at liaison meetings with the users of those radio facilities. The National Frequency Agency has been working with ARCEP. ARCEP is France's Electronic Communications Post and Print Media Distribution Regulation Authority, an independent administrative authority which is the architect and guardian of France's internet, fixed and mobile radio and postal networks. And the commercial use of the 144 to 146 MHz amateur band has thus been authorised, for use between the 26th of July to the 11th of August, and then again from the 28th of August to the 8th of September 2024. The 2 metre band can be used by the official host broadcaster of the Games and its service providers, amongst other stakeholders. The band will thus accommodate PMR voice walkie-talkie style simplex communications, using a bandwidth of 6.25 and 12.5 kHz, with up to 1 watt of power output. The use of these frequencies has been authorised at sites of competition and non-competition, for example, fan zones, which adds up to about 40 locations, mainly in metropolitan France, in the Paris region, including the capital Paris itself, Elancourt, Versailles, Saint-Quentin, Saint-Denis, Le Bourget, Le Courneuve, Clichy-sous-Bois, Villepin, and vers marne and also in the provinces of Lille, Lyon, Saint-Étienne, Marseille, Nice, Bordeaux, Châteauroux, and Nantes. And use has also been authorised for events taking place in French Polynesia in the South Pacific. At all of these sites, frequencies in the amateur band 430 to 440 MHz will also be used to accommodate PMR voice service simplex channels. The band 1240 to 1260 MHz, open to the amateur service on a secondary basis, will accommodate broadcast audio equipment with power of less than or equal to 50 mW and a bandwidth of less than or equal to 200 kHz. That includes radio microphones.
Finally, in the band between 2300 and 2483.5 MHz, part of which is also open to the amateur service on a secondary basis, mobile video links up to 10 watts with a maximum channel of 20 MHz will be deployed. The frequencies will be made available to the organising committee of the Paris 2024 Olympic Games during the period from one month before the opening ceremony of the Olympic Games to one week after the closing ceremony of the Paralympic Games. That's from the 26th of June to the 15th of September 2024. The regulator ANFR has stated that in order for the frequencies to be usable in good clear conditions, it will be essential that in the vicinity of the sites, radio amateur usage will need to be moderated during this period. ANFR say that they will rely on all members of the amateur radio community to do this. It's interesting to note that amateurs in France are the primary users allocated to the 2 metre band, but this is not the first time that the French authorities have made an attack on this status. In 2019, the French authorities tried to make 144 to 146 megahertz a shared primary band between radio amateurs and the commercial aeronautical mobile service. This failed not least because of the representations from other nearby countries, who could probably see what problems this was going to cause them, but it's seems pretty obvious that the French regulator is still looking for ways to grab at this valuable piece of spectrum. You can read the full ANFR announcement at www.anfr.fr. The ARRL invites you to be part of Club Station, the newest column in QST. This column is a space for radio clubs to share the different ways in which they're successful to help other clubs grow. They do this by offering advice and practical solutions to common experiences and problems. In each issue, a different club will share how they undertook a specific activity or project, how and why it was successful, and any challenges they may have had to overcome throughout the process. Some examples include, but are not limited to, successful community club projects, innovative ways to attract new members, getting youth involved with ham radio, and developing active hams. Clubs are the backbone of the amateur radio community, said ARRL Field Services Manager Mike Walters, W8ZY. If your club is doing something that will inspire other clubs, we want to hear from you. In order to help you tell your story, ARRL has published author guidelines that are geared toward Club Station and they include a club profile form, said QST editor Lena Figluski, KC1RMP. Both of these documents can be found at www.arrl.org slash QST dash club dash station dash guidelines dash and dash profile dash form. You don't have to have any writing experience to be published in QST. If your submission is accepted, our editorial staff will work with you to get your story ready for publication. All clubs are welcome to participate. The first iteration of Club Station appeared in the August 2022 issue of QSD and includes more information about what members can expect to see from the column. If you have any questions, contact us at club at ARRL.org. We look forward to hearing from you and about your radio club. Updated numbers from ARRL Field Day 2022 now show 1,235,265 total reported contacts as of July 26, 2022. ARRL Contest Program Manager Paul Burke, N1SFE, reported that 4,774 Field Day entries have been submitted and there were 28,250 field day participants. The class breakdown is as follows. 1,141 Class A Club Non-Club Portable, 598 Class B One or Two Person Portable and Battery One or Two Person Portable, 56 Class C Mobile, 2,093 Class D Home Stations. 735 Class E, home stations using emergency power. 151 Class F, emergency operation centers. The last day to submit entries was Tuesday, July 26th, so the numbers will change in the coming weeks. 
Burke added that 237 entries are missing either the required dupe sheet or, in lieu of that, a Cabrillo formatted log or supporting documentation for claimed bonus points. He encourages all entrants to check the ARRL Field Day Entries Received page to verify that their entry has been accepted and if it is complete or pending any supporting documentation. Additional documentation and log files can be added to previously submitted field day entries by using the link that was provided in the confirmation email that was received upon submittal. Any questions regarding field day entries should be directed to fieldday at ARRL.org. American National Amateur Radio Society, the ARRL, reports that the Federal Communications Commission, which is the American Communications Regulator, has started accepting applications for a telecommunications specialist at its High Frequency Direction Finding Center in Columbia, Maryland. The center supports the FCC in its over-the-air spectrum observation capabilities and provides direct support to the public safety community and other federal partners by locating interference sources on the HF radio spectrum that's below 30 MHz. The center is part of the FCC's Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau in the Operations and Emergency Management Division. So, what does the job entail? The duties for the incumbent include performing watch duties and serving as a technical authority, providing technical assistance and guidance to communication systems users to resolve radio interference complaints and problems and collecting radio signal analysis information. The role uses radio signal analysis equipment deployed throughout the United States to collect, correlate and analyse characteristics of radio signals involved in interference problems. This includes distress or safety related signals or other radio signals involved in other high priority activities such as law enforcement or national defence at HF, VHF and UHF. Collecting radio signal analysis information requires the understanding of complaints, inquiries and comments from multiple sources. It also resources the investigation of compliance with the FCC's rules and regulations and determining the appropriate actions to take utilising the FCC's remote HF network of radio direction finders and radio signal analysis equipment. The role also involves developing definitive technical solutions concerning telecommunication system architectures, interoperability, expansion potential and overall end-to-end -end compatibility. The job holder is required to interact with the public, licensees of various radio services, private industries, other government agencies and representatives of foreign governments. The post holder would be representing the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau in meetings within and outside the agency, including the conducting of formal and on-the-job training of co-workers, new recruits, clients and participants of the United States Telecommunication Training Institute. Well, if you think this is a job for you, visit usajobs.gov for the complete job summary and how to apply. While participating in the Black Hills Amateur Radio Club's annual Summits on the Air event in South Dakota on July 16, 2022, two amateur radio operators helped spot a potential forest fire. Ryan Lindblom, KE0LXT, president of the Black Hills Amateur Radio Club, and Christopher Jacks, KD0RAS, had made their trek to Cicero Peak. Just before heading back down, they noticed what might be smoke or dust to the south near Hot Springs. Lindblom made a contact on their simplex frequency to ask a local amateur radio operator if there had been any reports of Forest Service activity in the area. An off-duty ranger was monitoring a local ham repeater from his home, heard traffic from Cicero Peak, and called in the alert. A fire crew and a helicopter were able to contain a small fire 2.5 miles south of Pringles, South Dakota. Ward Hall, WC0Y, attending the Black Hills Summits on the Air weekend for his second year, reported that a forest ranger on Bear Mountain stepped out of the ranger tower to greet him, but at the time was busy monitoring firefighting traffic. I could hear the radioactivity while I was on the ground near the tower, said Hall. 
The ranger later told me that the Forest Service was alerted to a small fire when an off-duty ranger was monitoring a local ham repeater and heard the traffic from Cicero Peak. Hall said the ranger credited the ham activity for an early alert that allowed them to address the fire while it was small. He was very appreciative of how the ham activity helped them and asked that I pass it on, Hall added. ARRL Dakota Division Director Bill Lippert, AC0W, applauded the work of the amateur radio operators for early reporting of what could have been a major fire, as well as credited the Forest Service for their quick response. The Black Hills Amateur Radio Club had 12 people participating in their Black Hills Soda weekend. The club has 75 members and covers the Black Hills region of South Dakota, which is in the southwest corner of the state. They are headquartered in Rapid City, South Dakota, and they are an ARRL-affiliated club. Former FCC Chairman Ajit Pai arguably did devastating damage to net neutrality and many regulatory factors that went along with it, one of those being the claim that a fairly abysmal, by today's standards, 25 megabits per second download speed and 3 megabit per second upload speed were acceptable standards for internet service speed. Current FCC Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel disagrees with that stance and recently proposed a boost in U.S. broadband standards, raising them to 100 megabits per second download and 20 megabits per second upload. Rosenworcel put her proposal of raised U.S. broadband standards before fellow commissioners of the FCC recently, as reported by Ars Technica. Where former FCC Chairman Ajit Pai once claimed that 25 megabits per second download and 3 megabits per second upload were enough, as adopted under 2015 Chairman Tom Wheeler, Rosenworcel claims times have changed and these standards simply don't fit today's regular needs in internet service. The needs of internet users long ago surpassed the FCC's 25 over 3 speed metric, especially during a global health pandemic that moved so much of life online, Rosenworcel stated in her announcement. The 25 over 3 metric isn't just behind the times, it's a harmful one because it masks the extent to which low-income neighborhoods and rural communities are being left behind and left offline. Laws in the United States require the FCC to annually assess whether advanced telecommunications capability is being deployed to all Americans in a reasonable and timely fashion. It also demands the FCC take immediate action to accelerate deployment if it should find current standards lacking. Ajit Pai was instrumental during the Trump administration in dismantling net neutrality regulations and protections before his resignation prior to the Biden administration's tenure. Keeping standards low was arguably part of Pi aiding telecom companies with passing grades in annual assessment and reporting. Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel will need a 3-2 to two Democratic vote in the FCC to overturn Pi's prior deregulation. But if it passes, it could mean big things for Internet standards in the U.S. Stay tuned for further updates as we follow the story. Space boffins are watching the skies for a 23-metric-ton Chinese rocket booster that's expected to crash back to Earth. The debris measures 53 meters in length and is a remnant of a mission earlier this week to deliver the Wenqian Laboratory Module to China's Tiangong Space Station. Wenqian itself is an exciting addition to the Chinese orbital complex and is the first module to extend the existing Tiani Core Module, which was launched in 2021. However, being a hefty beast, Wenqian required a hefty rocket, in this case the heavy lift Long March 5B, used previously to launch Tiani. Other variants of the Long March 5 were used to launch the Chang's 5 lunar mission and the Tianwen-1 mission to Mars. The problem is the massive first stage of the Long March 5B also performs the duties of the upper stages of the other rockets until it has not been dumped down range. Instead, it entered orbit and inevitably will come back down to Earth. The problem is working out when and where. While other rockets, including some of China's own, are capable of restarting their engines in orbit and disposing of themselves in a controlled manner, this does not apply this time around. Instead, the descent will be uncontrolled as the orbit decays, and according to federally funded researchers at the Aerospace Corporation, there's a non-zero probability of the surviving debris landing in a populated area. How much debris? Well, the aerospace engineering and space experts reckon something that big simply won't burn up in the atmosphere. Instead, the rule of thumb is 20 to 40 percent of the mass will reach the ground. The latest prediction for re-entry is sometimes around July 31st. To make matters worse, approximately 88 percent of the world's population live under the currently estimated footprint of the debris, although that figure in footprints will shrink in the coming days as the new data becomes available 
and predictions are refined. With luck, there's every chance that whatever returns to Earth will simply fall into the ocean. This is not China's first rodeo when it comes to uncontrolled re-entry of rocket stages. Debris from two previous Long March 5B launches also tumbled back to Earth. Other countries, including Russia and the U.S., have similarly had issues with uncontrolled entries of large objects. The annual EAA, Experimental Aircraft Association's Air Venture, is still underway in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, through Sunday, July 31st, and amateur radio is well represented throughout that air show. ARRL radio communications exhibit, supported by member volunteers in Hangar B, has been active and attracted hundreds of attendees seeking information about becoming a ham. ARRL, by the way, is posting photos of that event on its Facebook page. Sort of attending Air Venture can build a small ARRL radio receiver kit designed by Levi Sema, KN4YHS, as part of Kid Venture. That's a hands on exhibit area at the Air Venture exhibit. Among other ham radio exhibitors are participating this year are ICOM America, Ham Radio Outlet, and West Mountain Radio. The next QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo, a full featured virtual ham radio convention, is September 17th and 18th of this year. For more details on this exciting virtual ham exposition, we go to John Ross, KD8IDJ, who files this report from ARRL headquarters. The online event includes speakers and presentations, fully interactive video lounges where participants can meet each other in chat, and an exhibit hall full of vendors and organizations. While the Ham Expo was originally created in August 2020 as an alternative to canceled in-person ham radio conventions due to the COVID-19 pandemic, it has evolved into a regularly held event for amateur radio learning through peer-submitted presentations on nearly every amateur radio subject, lively discussions, and interaction. The Expo uses virtual event technology using platforms produced by VFairs and Kumascope. The Kumascope Space Lounges were a fantastic addition to the Expo last March and were full of hams and conversations during the entire Expo weekend, said Ed Guth, 471UG, the founder of the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo. New for this year's Ham Expo is the Poster Gallery Hall that includes a product showcase and interactive project submitted by amateurs. The product showcase is a way for vendors who may or may not have a booth to demonstrate individual products through videos, white papers, and slides. Each showcase is fully interactive through text chat and supports opportunities for vendors to follow up with interested visitors. The poster gallery will also feature and include an opportunity for individuals to submit papers, projects, and articles to be enjoyed by all Expo delegates. Accepted gallery submissions will include a free ticket to the Expo. Sponsor and exhibitor opportunities are still available. The $10 ticket for the Expo will go on sale in August. Anyone can attend the Expo from anywhere in the world over the Internet. For more information, go to QSOTodayHamExpo.com. The ARRL is a QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo partner. The 35th Annual Satellite Educators Association Conference will be held on July 29th and 30th, 2022. This year's theme is Earth Speaks, We Listen. The event is hosted by the Charter College of Education at California State University in Los Angeles. This year's convention will feature Frederick Robb, KK6NOW, presenting classroom activities with the AMSAT CubeSat simulator. Rob will explore how to engage students with CubeSat operation and transmissions of data using the AMSAT CubeSat simulator. The presentation will highlight the work by the CubeSat Sim Educational Materials team of Paul Graveline, K1YUB, Alan Johnston, KUTY, Frederick Robb, KK6NOW, Mark Samus, KD2XS, and David White, WD6DRI. SEA is an organization of educators supporting science, technology, engineering, and math learning for pre-kindergarten to postgraduate students using real-world applications from satellites and satellite data. According to Space.com, the James Webb Space Telescope, which recently transmitted its first color images to us here on Earth, has suffered a serious damage following micrometeorite strikes. Scientists said in a recent report the impact sustained in late May may have disrupted the space telescope's operation more than first believed. The scientists wrote that they believe the problem is not correctable. 
Their biggest concern is the long-term effect on the primary mirror, which scientists believe will be degraded as a result of the meteoroid strike. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. And now, sitting in for the vacationing Leo Laporte, we welcome Micah Sargent. One of the things that bugs me about tech is that it has all of these different complicated processes that tech gets harder and harder and harder. And that over time, it seems like it is just getting more and more complicated. And a lot of times what I see when someone asks me about tech is they sort of blame themselves. Oh, I, you know, I'm just, I, I, I'm, I'm, in many cases I hear this, we hear this on the radio all the time. Oh, I'm just too old. You know, I don't, I don't get it. Or, oh, you know, this isn't my, I, I'm really good at this, but tech is not what I'm really good at. And there are a lot of excuses made, a lot of, of uh, moments where we're, we're blaming ourselves. And I think it's even more the case when we look at folks who are handling, uh, having had data breaches or being tricked into giving up their user information. And so this is just a time we're going to do a little bit of tech therapy here. Because what I try to get across, and anytime I help a family member with technology, for example, something that I always say is you cannot blame yourself. You are not responsible for the fact that this tech is failing you. The tech is responsible for the fact that the tech is failing you. And I truly believe that. You know, we will sometimes make jokes. It's what is it? PebCAC problem exists between computer a keyboard and the use. I don't know. But basically saying that it's the human being that's at fault. And yeah, funny, haha. But let's be realistic here. Technology does get more and more complicated. And Leo and I have talked before about how empathy needs to play more of a role in technology, that the engineers, the developers, the folks behind the creation of all of this technology have to remember who their users are. And some do. And I think that that's some of the best technology that we have. But look, I'm here talking to you because technology is complicated and continues to get more and more complicated. And every time I help my family, they live back in Missouri. I moved to California far, far away from them. And I help them and I do my best over the phone to give them the help that they need for the technology. But this stuff is so complicated that it's hard to do. And I hear them blaming themselves and you can't do that. And I think that's particularly the case when it comes to data breaches or the, what is it? It's social engineering hacks where you are convinced that you have uh, had your password stolen. And so you go through the process of trying to get your password back. And then lo and behold, that little email that you got was actually a fake. I've had people come to me and say, oh, I'm so stupid. What was I thinking? How could I have done this? No, no, you are not the problem. The person or the people behind it who did that thing, they are the problem. They are where you should put all of that energy that you're having. Put that on them and then take the opportunity to reclaim that power. You should say, look, this was a clever thing. They got me. Yes, they got me. But it's not my fault. I'm not the one that is to blame here. It's these nefarious people who've decided to do this thing and who were able to successfully do it. And I understand we do. We do have that moment where we go, oh, how could I have possibly be tricked by this? But so many people are tricked by this. That's why they keep doing it, because they can get people. And it, it, it plays on, in many cases, kind of our, our baser nature. You see that in the moment and you immediately, your fear centers are responding to that. Your, your adrenaline rises, your heart starts racing, and you don't think as clearly as you normally would. So don't blame yourself, blame them. And back to the technology, I've got to, I think we could all take a page out of the playbook of, uh, of my partner because <laughs> I used to get really annoyed about this. Anytime some technology wouldn't work, the Apple TV is a really good example. It's like his worst enemy. Anytime the Apple TV wouldn't work, there'd be uh, Netflix would stop working or the TV would not display the video properly and uh, it would stop working in some way. He, oh, this thing is so stupid. It, it doesn't work how it's supposed to. Why is it never working? I used to get so annoyed. It's like, no, 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 no. We can figure this out. We can figure out why it's doing this. Don't don't blame the Apple TV. 
And then I had this realization of like, actually do blame the Apple TV. If, you know, his phone's not working. Something's going wrong there. Ah, why is this thing not better? It should be doing this thing. Again, I used to get annoyed by that. And now I go, I think we could all take a page out of his playbook and say, actually, we should blame the technology because it is at fault. And even if it's something that, yes, we can eventually learn how to do and how to fix it, fine. We can take that on. But the fact that it's not easy, that it's not just sort of second nature, that it's not a simple process of going, okay, there's this problem, and intuitively I know how to solve it, that is understandable. And the caller that I spoke to, one of the things uh, that he was talking about was the sort of, not ethereal nature, but the non-physical nature of the problems that we have with tech, where a mechanical error, you know, if your uh, sewing machine stops working, and it's making this sound, I can pop open the side of my sewing machine, hit the pedal to start it going, and I see, holy moly, I did not properly put the spool into the bobbin, and I can fix it. But when my phone won't turn on, I can't take the back off of it and look for the bobbin that's improperly threaded. So that makes technology even more complicated. And the folks who know how to look at the sort of virtual bobbin are the engineers who are creating this technology. But we don't necessarily, every person doesn't have access, have the ability to pop open the phone, look at the bobbin. That's why you've got us here to help you do that. And sometimes even we get stumped. You've seen that plenty of times. So I want everybody to be mindful of the fact that this technology should work and it should work well and it shouldn't be as hard as it sometimes can be. And to give yourself a little space, give yourself a little room, give yourself a little grace, and maybe even take a page out of the playbook of my partner who's just like, you know what? This technology stinks. It doesn't work how I expect it to. And that's a problem. And it's okay. It's okay to say that. And it's okay to be mad. And it's okay to you know, want it to be better. We should all want it to be better. And I think when it comes, again, to breaches, data security, of course, I can tell you, back up your devices, uh, turn on two-factor authentication, do this, do that. And I hope that you will. But in the instance that somebody bypasses those things, that they get in to the system, you didn't have a backup, you didn't have two-factor authentication turned on, you shouldn't spend your time going, I am the problem here. Because somebody decided to do something they should not have done and to bring harm to you through the accessing of your technology through the accessing of your data. And that is a them problem. And yes, then it becomes time. We got to step it up. We got to do what's right. We got to fix it. And that's what we're here to do. I may not know how to do this, but it's okay. I'm going to learn how to do it. And I'm not the one that's at fault. It's a technology that could stand to be a little bit simpler. Just a little bit of tech therapy, a little bit of grace for you, a little bit of mindfulness of the fact that this stuff is hard. And frankly, it gets harder and harder because the technology gets more and more complex. You have been listening to The Tech Guy. Leo Laporte will be back next week. That was Micah Sargent. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives here on This Week in Amateur Radio. This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, with Amateur Radio History Headlines. 1952, the FCC allows phone operation on 40 meters, which had been CW only. The 15 meter band is opened. The advanced class is withdrawn from new applicants, although present holders can continue to renew in the exclusive 75 and 20 meter phone segments, which previously belonged to class A only, are now opened to generals and conditionals. Everyone, conditional and above, has the same privileges. 1953, the FCC starts issuing K calls to amateurs in the 48 states due to the increased ham population. 1954, depressed and broke from his patent fights with RCA over FM, Major Edwin Armstrong commits suicide. His wife continues the fight, winning the last battle in 1967 when the Supreme Court rules that Armstrong did indeed invent FM. 
1955. Technicians are given six meter privileges to help populate the band and to encourage experimentation. The ARRL and most hams oppose two meters for technician. Wayne Green becomes the editor of CQ magazine. 1956 through 1960. A gradual technical revolution on two fronts. First, transistors find their way into the ham shack, first in power supplies, then audio sections, then receivers, and finally QRP transmitters. But most equipment was still 100% tubes. Also, SSB is catching up on AM in terms of popularity. By the 1960s, sideband pulls ahead of AM. This has been Amateur Radio History Headlines with Bill Continelli, W2XOY, for this week in Amateur Radio. Foundations of Amateur Radio The art of amateur radio is a globe-spanning activity held together by radio waves and the promise of a community with a shared uncommon interest. The strength of a community depends entirely on the members of that community. Without the efforts of each individual amateur, our worldwide license to experiment is doomed. You might ask yourself what part you have to play in this. Consider what would happen if a group of amateurs decided to transmit on an unlicensed frequency, or purposefully interfered with other legal users. It's obvious that the regulatory response to such illegal activities would be swift, and left unchecked, it would spark the end of our hobby. What prevents that from happening is our common purpose, our common interests, our willingness to address such behaviour, or said in another way, our community standards. It's a thing that keeps us talking, sharing, learning, experimenting and having fun along the way. I've been told many times that I shouldn't expect all amateurs to be friends, but consider for a moment the sheer diversity of our community. For starters, we are scattered around the planet. We have different cultural and political sensibilities. We have different religions and expectations. We don't even speak the same language, even if you forget that the Japanese station you just had a QSO with was using phonetics not even close to their native language. Those differences are mostly attributes of geography, but they don't end there. We have differences in our households and family structures, our work life and finances, our playtime and our interests. We also differ in age, skin colour, gender and even our sexuality, orientation and gender identity. Even among all those differences, we are still radio amateurs together, with our personal preferences for ICOM, Yesu, Kenwood or some other brand, our desire to use QRP or kilowatts, our need to use a Morse key, our voice or a computer. We choose to use a repeater or not, choose HF or not, like to chat or not, build antennas or not. So it's with all those differences in mind that I'm distressed to report that yet another amateur has been bullied out of our community. An amateur who joyfully participated in this community, who made videos, wrote software, learnt and shared. Like others I know, she was bullied in our community because she was different. And it's not the first time I've witnessed this behaviour, and it's not the first time I've called out this unacceptable conduct by so-called members of our community. Different? How, you ask? Does it really matter, or are you asking to determine if there is a valid reason for making her feel uncomfortable? To be clear, our community is a welcoming environment, filled with hope and joy, but there is a small, rotten element in our midst that we need to rip out root and branch, much like we would if it was deliberate HF interference. You might think that given that this abuse exists on Reddit, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, QRZ, email, telephone, letterbox, in clubs and on air, that it's a majority experience. That's not the case. The same individuals harass fellow amateurs across multiple platforms as entertainment, causing untold harm to their victims. The standard you walk past is the standard you accept. It's not just up to victims of bullying and harassment in a community to speak out. As members of our community, we, amateurs, have a responsibility to speak out also. Anyone who doesn't is part of the problem. Our community is so diverse as to never be one single thing. A bully is a bully, no matter which words are used to sugarcoat it. I'd like to invite you to consider any bullying you accepted in silence, either personally, as a witness, directly or indirectly. 
This community is strong, it's resilient, it's resourceful, it's you and I. It's our duty to stand tall and speak out loud and proud about any victimization. Even if you've never considered that this is happening in your community, look around and notice people leaving the hobby unexpectedly and examine why that might be the case. You might ask what it is that you can do to help. For starters, calling it out at every occurrence is part of communicating to the victim that they're not alone. It tells the community that they are part of the solution. It tells the bully that what they're doing is unacceptable. I host a weekly net where we talk about amateur radio and discuss issues like this as and when they occur. We've done so in the past and will continue to offer a safe space for members of this community. I have and continue to offer my email address, cq at vk6flab.com, for anyone who is struggling with this to discuss any bullying that they are dealing with. I have experienced some of what this amateur has gone through at the hands of this community, and I will not stand for it any longer, and neither should you. Keeping quiet and changing frequency is not the solution, as time after time experience has proven. Calling out a bully and any bullying behaviour is calling out a vicious, minuscule minority with a peanut brain who needs to be read the Riot Act. They are not welcome in this community. They are few and far between and we really don't need or want them in our midst. In my opinion, the community must take ownership of this problem and address it directly, rather than sit on the fence and leave a victim wondering why they're on their own. If you are a victim of bullying in this community, I stand with you. And if you're a bully, I'll do everything I can to call you out. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. Pete, Mike Zero, Papa, Sierra X-Ray at Essex Ham, reports that in the biggest shake-up to UK amateur radio licensing in 20 years, the Radio Society of Great Britain has unveiled details of Direct to Full, a new way to get a UK full amateur radio license without firstly working up through the foundation and intermediate license exam levels. Essex Ham have also put together a video answering some common questions. Direct to Full is an alternative way of getting a full amateur radio license without the need to go through the current three-tier system of Foundation, Intermediate and Full. Direct to Full is primarily aimed at people looking to get a license who already have a solid knowledge of electronics and or radio frequency techniques. It's also available to existing Foundation and Intermediate license holders looking to jump to a full license who feel they have sufficient knowledge to pass this alternative exam. The exam has 75 questions, lasts for two and a half hours, and is only available online. There's no paper version available, and there are no practical assessments. Essex Ham say that it's not yet clear whether the exam will be by remote invigilation or at a registered exam centre. The assumption is probably that both will be offered, as with the current exam set up, with remote invigilation being the favoured option for most students. Direct to Full becomes available from the 21st of January 2023. The exam will consist of two parts which are sat in the same session, both of which have to be passed. The first part has a higher pass mark, presumably to satisfy Ofcom that license conditions are clearly understood. Those from an electronics or RF background may potentially be weak on the amateur radio specifics, which Essex Ham suggests may be why the bar is set a little higher for this first part. Part 1 has 18 questions, with a pass mark of 14 questions, that's a 77.7% .7 pass mark. 12 questions are on licensing conditions and station identification, and 6 questions are on operating practices and procedure questions. Part 2 has 57 questions, with a pass mark of 36, which relates to a 63.2% pass mark. Questions are on the subjects of technical aspects, transmitters and receivers, feeders and antennas, propagation, electromagnetic compatibility, safety, and measurements and construction. The RSGB has released a 42-page syllabus, which broadly matches the current three-tier syllabus version 1.5. The idea of Direct to Full was put out for public consultation in February 2021. The results have yet to be shared by the RSGB. More information can be found on the RSGB website, and the full discussion can be read at essexham.co.uk.
In AMSAT News this week from Bruce Page, KK5DO, the first call for proposals for symposium presentations are invited for the 40th annual AMSAT Space Symposium and General Meeting. That will be held on October 21st to the 22nd in Bloomington, Minnesota. Presentations can cover any topic of interest to the amateur satellite community. AMSAT is requesting a tentative title for each submission, which should be sent as soon as possible. A final copy must be submitted, though, by October 14, 2022, to be included in the proceedings. Abstracts and papers should be sent to Dan Schultz, N8FGV, at N8FGV at AMSAT.org. According to the July 17th AMSAT News Service Weekly Bulletins, the annual AMSAT Space Symposium will feature uh, amateur radio satellite presentations, operating techniques, news, and plans from the amateur satellite world. There's a board of directors meeting that's open to AMSAT members. Opportunities to meet the board members and officers also there. AMSAT's annual general membership meeting, an auction, an annual banquet, a keynote speaker, and door prizes. More information about the 2022 AMSAT Symposium will be posted on the AMSAT website as it becomes available. It's time for this week's Propagation Forecast Report, brought to us each week by Tad Cook, K7RA, in Seattle, Washington, who reports this week that although images of the sun this week showed plenty of sunspots, only two new spots emerged, one on July 21st and another on July 25th. The average daily sunspot number declined from 137.3 to 91.1, and the average daily solar flux softened by 50 points to 107.6. The headline on spaceweather.com on July 28th said, Quiet Sun. Geomagnetic indicators began this reporting week fairly active with the planetary A index at 22. Then it quickly quieted down to an average of 11.7 for the week, higher than the 9.4 average reported last week. Average middle latitude A and dice increased from 9 to 10.4. Taking a look back a year ago shows this cycle is progressing nicely. Looking back to this week in 2021, the average daily sunspot number was just 48.9 and average daily solar flux was only 81.3. A year prior to that, the average daily sunspot number in 2020 was just 3.1. That is because there were five days with no sunspots and then two days with a sunspot number of only 11, which is the minimum non-zero sunspot number. So why 11? A sunspot number of 11 does not mean 11 sunspots. It means that there was just one sunspot group, which counts for 10 points, and one sunspot in that group, counting for one, producing a total of 11. And all of this confusion is because of the arcane historical method of counting sunspots. The predicted solar flux shows it peaking at 130 on August 11th. So looking ahead, the predicted solar flux is 96 on July 30th, 98 again on July 31st and August 1st, 96 on August 2nd and 3rd, 98 on August 4th, and then jumping to 115 on August 5th and 6th, 113 on August 7th through the 8th, and then 120, 125, 130, and 125 on August 9th through the 12th. Taking a quick look at the predicted planetary A index, it will be 12 on July 30th, 8 on July 31st and August 1st, 5 on August 2nd and 3rd, 8 on August 4th, 5 on August 5th, all the way through the 10th, and then 8 on August 11th and 12th. There's controversy in Brazil over proposed amateur regulations that include mandatory use of Logbook of the World for upgrades. In a move being opposed by Brazil's National Amateur Radio Society, use of the ARRL's Logbook of the World would become mandatory for any radio amateurs in that country who are seeking license upgrades, according to a Southgate News Service online report. Brazil's National Amateur Radio Society, Liga de Amadores Brasileiros de Radio Emissão, announced that the national regulator Anatel proposes that hams wishing to advance to a Class A or Class B license from a Class C would be required to confirm QSOs by using Logbook of the World. This proposal is designed as one component in an alternative being considered to replace the CW test. It is being called the Experience Test and it mandates that Logbook of the World be used to document contacts that prove the upgrade applicant has sufficient experience to warrant the change in license class. 
Separately, applicants would also have to fulfill the experience requirement by showing participation in courses and radio-related activities. The proposed use of the free online QSO authentication service has drawn some controversy. In an online statement, Labre claims its use would constitute outsourcing to a foreign entity because the service is provided by the American Radio Relay League. Labre also believes this proposed mandate puts applicants at a disadvantage if they do not engage in contesting or in DXing. Anatel has been seeking written comments and plans to schedule a public hearing on the proposal. In radio sport contesting this week, many good opportunities for the week ahead. On July 30th, it's the Feld Hell Sprint. That's digital. July 30th through the 31st, the RSGB IOTA Contest, CW and phone. July 30th, WAB 144 MHz low power phone. July 30th through the 31st, the Satellite Tennessee State Parks on the Air event. That's all modes there. July 31st, ARS Flight of the Bumblebees, CW. August 2nd, the Worldwide Sideman Activity Contest, that's on phone. On August 2nd, the ARS Spartan Sprint, that's CW. And on August 3rd, a phone weekly test, that is phone. Some upcoming section, state, and division conventions you might want to be aware of. July 30th through the 31st, it's the ARRL West Virginia State Convention, that's in Sutton, West Virginia. August 6th and 7th, the Cedar Valley ARC Tech Fest, hosting the ARRL Iowa State Convention. That's in Central City, Iowa. August 13th, the Tidewater Ham Fest and Swap Meet. That's hosting the ARRL Virginia Convention. That's in Portsmouth, Virginia. August 20th through the 21st, the Huntsville Ham Fest, hosting the ARRL Southwest Division Convention in Huntsville, Alabama. August 26th through the 28th, the Northeast Ham Exposition, hosting the ARRL New England and Hudson Division Conventions. That's in Marlboro, Massachusetts. And September 2nd through the 4th, the Shelby Ham Fest, hosting the ARRL North Carolina section. Operating on two meters from a hot air balloon some 2,500 feet above the Belgian province of East Flanders, this operation is getting some extra lift. It's a club-wide project overseen by Jurgen ON8VC, Niels, ON3NSB, and Bernard, ON5MB, members of the radio club Zadegem, ON6ZT. The launch for the flight, which will last about an hour and a half, is scheduled for August 10th at about 6 p.m. local time. It is, of course, weather dependent. Jurgen said there will be two pilot ground stations, Erwin, ON7XF, and Theo, ON4CLF will handle logging for all station's work. Dominique, ON3DDH, and Chris, ON6ME, will be documenting the event in photos by following the balloon by car. The QSL cards will feature many of the photos. Jurgen said that the club has a QSO party each month on VHF, mostly with local stations operating on 145.550. The Hams decided a few months ago to try and incorporate a hot air balloon into the activity. Stations are expected to spot their contacts on the website DX Summit FI, but amateurs outside the region of this very local event can still follow the action on APRS. Club manager Bernard OM5MB will run an APRS tracker that can be followed at APRS.FI. Jurgen said this QSO party is kind of a test flight. He said there are already plans in the works to try this on HF next year. Although the practical exam is no longer a requirement for a foundation license in the UK, practical experience is still a vital part of getting started on the air. Members of the Sutton and Cheam Radio Society in Surrey are providing that to newcomers with a hands-on session on the September 11th Surrey. New license holders will learn how to adjust an aerial for various frequencies, make contacts on VHF and HF, and learn how to set up a station. They will also get a chance to hear and learn more about Morse code if they so desire. Many of these demonstrations were once elements in the formally mandated practical exam. The practical proficiency test requirement was removed so that online testing could take place during the COVID-19 pandemic. Practicals for the intermediate exam were eliminated the previous year. Those attending will be asked to pay a fee to cover use of the headquarters of the 7th Banstead Scouts. The Bendigo Amateur Radio and Electronics Club in Australia is preparing for the launch of its special interest group that focuses on field operations and regional emergency support. The group will begin its activities when members meet on Friday, August 19th at the Club Hall in Bendigo, Victoria. 
According to an email from club president Neil VK3ZVX, this is intended to be a group that plans, prepares, and trains for inevitable crises. The first meeting will focus on show and tell, allowing members to share the equipment they have used in previous field operations, such as mills on the air, summits on the air, or parks on the air activations. This includes any go kits, portable camping gear, solar panels, and batteries. Neil stressed that perfection is not required. In fact, he writes in his email, even if it's only a half-baked idea, a half-built project, or a pile of bits for one, bring it along and prepare to explain if need be. Neil said the point of the show and tell is to obtain the widest range of ideas and inspiration. Every month, a Spanish magazine known as Selva Mar Noticias transmits friendship, goodwill, and radio education, not over the amateur bands, but through the pages of its free publication. Created by Manel EA3IAZ and Juan Jose EA3IEW, it has devoted itself to environmental issues and to celebrating the achievements of the youngest members of the amateur radio community. The magazine also supports YLs deeply involved in the hobby. The August edition of the magazine shines the spotlight on those YLs by devoting one-third of its articles to YLs and their accomplishments. The magazine is also sponsoring a YL diploma contest that runs from August 15th through to the 21st. Citizens Band Stations and SWLs are also able to participate. Stations will be using Echolink and the digital modes. Manel and Juan Jose said that the event is open to operators in all countries. The diploma will be presented as a downloadable PDF file. Although since starting publishing two years ago, the magazine has been translated into several languages, including an accessible version for the disabled, the August edition will only be available in Spanish. Rupert Godwin's Golf Mike 6 Hotel Victor Yankee writes on the Register website that electrical engineers are on the brink of extinction, threatening the entire tech ecosystem. While computer science course take-up has gone up by over 90% in the past 50 years, electrical engineering has declined by the same amount. The electronics graduate has become rarer than an Intel-based smartphone. That part of the technology industry which actually makes things has always been divided between hardies and softies, soldering iron versus compiler, oscilloscope versus debugger. But Rupert says that the balance is lost. Something is very wrong at the heart of our technology creation supply chain. In short, where have all the hardies gone? For most of the history of electronics, it was an industry that didn't need to sell itself because it was inherently cool for geeks. Look at the biographies of the great names in electronics, such as Intel co-founder Robert Noyce, or the father of the information age, Claude Shannon. And you find them as teenage geeks, pulling apart, then rebuilding, then designing radios and guitar amplifiers. The post-war generation tore down military surplus gear to teach themselves how it worked and to mine components to build their own inventions. This remained broadly true until the turn of the 21st century. A reasonably bright kid would realise that the family cathode ray tube television was in fact a particle accelerator with its own multi-kilovolt high voltage generator, containing any amount of repurposable bits and pieces. Rupert Goodwin's comments that you could have a lot of fun with that. There were old analogue gadgets all over the place. You could peer inside Granny's radio and follow the signal path, component by component. Well, that's all gone now. If electronics are invisible at the start of a young engineer's life, they are invisible in the careers they may contemplate. In the 20th century, not only were consumer electronics full of differentiated analogue desirables, aerospace, the military and industry were too. Now everything is a screen with a user interface. You still need a lot of specialised hardware, but it's vanished deep into the background. No wonder everyone who once had the itch to solder now gets ensnared by software. Rupert concludes by asking whether it's possible for electronics to regain its status as a primary inspiration for young technical minds. Well, not without a lot of work from the industry that needs those minds, he says.
The pipeline electronics once took as the natural order has broken. To reach new talent, the magic must be re-exposed. You can read Rupert's fascinating full article at www.theregister.com. And now, with his segment on how to successfully compose a public service announcement to promote your radio club meeting or ham fest on local broadcast radio, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. In this series, we're looking into free promotion for your ham radio club's not-for-profit fundraiser, specifically the public service announcement, or PSA as they are more commonly called. The first step after obtaining all pertinent information, answering all the who, what, why, where, and when questions, is to write a rough draft of a simple 30-second script, or roughly two short paragraphs. A sample PSA for a ham fest could read something like this. The Bowen County Amateur Radio Club is hosting their third annual ham fest flea market and computer swap meet on Saturday, October 28th at 7 a.m. at the Bowen County Fairgrounds on Fairway Road, two miles east of State Road 9 in Bowen County. Gates open at 7 a.m. Parking is free. Admission is $5 per person. Senior citizens and children under 18 get in for free. The swap meet closes at 4 p.m. Come join the fun. Buy, sell, or trade your electronic stuff, too. The public is always welcome to attend. Stop in and find out more about amateur radio, sky-worn weather spotting, emergency preparedness, ham radio license testing, and free classes. That's Saturday, October 28th, 7 a.m. at the Bowen County Fairgrounds. See you at the Ham Fest. Well, in this sample PSA, we covered all the basic questions and wrote it to appeal to the non-ham but curious. We repeated the most important information of where and when. When we plan an event like a small ham fest, it is a given that most of the attendees are hams. But the biggest reward we reap is new club members and mostly from new hams. So write your PSA to appeal to the non-ham but curious. In this segment, we covered the basic elements of a proper PSA script. We kept it to two short paragraphs, provided all the information, and repeated the date, time, and location. Next time, we'll cover putting this information into a broadcaster-friendly format and getting it ready for sticking in the mail. This is Greg Stoddard, Kilo Fox, Nine Mike Papa, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. On the weekend of September 10th and 11th, 2022, the Summer Camp Facebook group is inviting all amateur radio operators to participate in the Summer Camp Memorial Activity. The on-air event is to honor Wolfgang Summer Camp, DJ2YL, Silent Key, the founder of the Summer Camp Radio Company who passed away in 2021. Activity will be on 80 meters, 40, 20, 15, 11, 10, and 2 meters with frequencies of 7.101, 14.301 megahertz, 21.301 megahertz, 28.301, and on 2 meters, 144.301 megahertz. Organizers emphasize this is not a contest and there's nothing to win. The on-air memorial is designed as a friendly get-together on the airwaves to share what equipment you use, when you purchased it, and if you're a longtime summer camp radio owner, how you acquired your radios. More information about the event is available on their special website or at the Summer Camp Facebook page. This is actually kind of a community builder. People feel closer to their neighbors in their community. They get to know them better than they ever did before they had these radios. Alan Thompson, W6WN, Public Information Officer for the El Dorado County Amateur Radio Club in Northern California. According to Alan, his Neighborhood Radio Watch program has about 400 members in El Dorado County spread across five distinct neighborhoods, each with its own GMRS repeater. Allen reports that his group also helped kickstart two other programs in nearby Amador County. Here's the second excerpt of two from Allen's talk, Radio for the Rest of Us. The next level up here in this layer cake is you drop in a few ham radio operators. Oddly enough, 
Our ham radio license does not cover GMRS, so you will need to get a GMRS license, like I mentioned earlier. We like to refer to these neighbors as our mother hens, because the mother hens can also talk to the GMRS repeater, and they can also do the heavy lifting in case there's any traffic that needs to go out of the area, in case folks cannot reach 911 or police or fire or first responders. The ham radio operators can do that. And then there's one other piece here that is a special alert tone that's supported by the radios that we've chosen. This is Motorola's Quick Call 2 pager technology that we use, and neighbors can leave their radios in a pre-programmed alert channel and avoid the chatter that might be on the repeater channel. So here's the radio sitting in the charger on the nightstand. It's quiet unless somebody sends the alert tone out, which will wake the radio up. And if there's something happening in the area, that's when we do this. So now you'll get a chance to hear that tone. And believe me, it is loud when it goes off. So that tells the radio's owner that it's time to wake up, start the coffee, and then put that radio over on the repeater channel if they want to monitor what's going on in the area. Well, I mentioned that we do actually have weekly nets. I call them safety nets. In each of these five areas, there is a distinct safety net that takes place on a certain day of the week at a certain time and on a certain frequency. We do this so that they can learn what to do before an event strikes. We don't want people just sitting with a radio in their house and then just waiting for somebody to call them. We want them to be active. So we encourage them to get on the net every week and for more than a couple of reasons. These nets help neighbors ensure that their radios are working, that their batteries are not dead, and that the repeater itself is working. It helps to kind of stress that repeater and make sure that it's going to stand up under a load before we really put a serious load on it. Also, it teaches folks how to use their radios before there's an emergency. So they're not trying to fiddle with buttons and push things and not understand what to do there. Every week, we share information of community interest, things like upcoming events in the area, radio information, workshops. We do several workshops, fire safe tips, and then who knows, recipes, gardening secrets, items for sale, you name it. The same kind of gab that we do on our ham radio nets, uh, just at the community level. And believe me, people love this. They think this is great because they don't really have an equivalent alternative, do they? Even if they get on Facebook or nextdoor.com, it's not that immediacy. It's not that back and forth of hearing people talk. And you can't really, well, most people don't know how to do it, is set up a party line call with cell phones. So they can't have everybody all interlink. Radio is the only way that we can do that. And what we found out is that this is actually kind of a community builder, that people feel closer to their neighbors in their community. They get to know them better than they ever did before they had these radios. We also conduct, as I mentioned, regular ongoing workshops, both online and in person. We'll do hybrids where we'll have some people come in, but other people will tune in online to do training. And we'll train folks on basic use and care of the radios and the batteries, how to behave on a safety net, what the role of the net controller is to be on that, how to use a scanner, understanding fire behavior, how fires move, understanding the incident command structure, which is starting to get a little bit sophisticated about how communication are handled, fire resilience, and lots of other topics. In fact, you're in a workshop right now, as a matter of fact, so this is not too far away from some of the introductory stuff that we do with our communities to explain the radio program. Okay, so back to our slide, what's in it for us? As a ham radio club, why should we do this non-ham radio stuff? Why should your club do this non-ham radio stuff? We don't make any money from it. It's certainly a lot of extra work, and it takes leadership and in many dedicated club members to support a successful program, to really get it up and running and sustain that program. And some would say community radio is not real ham radio, whatever real means. I'm not so sure anymore what that definition means, but here's a few reasons why we think this is a good idea and we think community radio just might help ensure the future of our clubs and our entire hobby. Since we started the radio program in late 2019, our free organic publicity is way up. We're now averaging three to four articles per year in our local rag, the Mountain Democrat. And this just came up this week, and we're really excited about it. We are going to be meeting with a photographer from Time Magazine who is flying out in a couple of weeks to do a photo documentary 
about our club and the Neighborhood Radio Watch program. We're really jazzed about that. We can hardly believe that that's happening. Our visibility in the community has never been higher. We're now being invited to host booths for free at many community events and fundraisers where we never have been before, like National Night Out, Homeowners Association meetings, fire safe workshops, and first responder meet and greets. We're being lumped into the same group with them. More events means more people see, hear, and join our neighborhood radio watch programs. The more people we can get on the radio each week, the more secure and stable these community safety programs become. And the more everyone benefits as everyone shares the load, we end up having more net controls. We have more resources if there is an event to monitor social media, Twitter, Facebook, CHP, sheriff's office, scanners, et cetera, et cetera. Everybody is assigned a job during an event, just like we do with a ham radio emergency net. And there really is safety in numbers. We've now distributed well over 200 radios, and I believe we're closing in on about 300, and more radios are going out every day in this program. And we're now getting shout-outs from our local city and county officials and recognition by police, sheriff, and fire. One of the county sheriff's deputies is also the head of our Office of Emergency Services, and he sits on our Neighborhood Radio Watch Advisory Board. And this is key. This is critical to our growth and our credibility in the community. And anybody who's going to start one of these programs Think about that. You need to get an advisory board and you need to get some of these key people on there to lend credibility to the program. You're in the middle of our second excerpt from a forum talk by Alan Thompson, W6WN, Public Information Officer for the El Dorado County Amateur Radio Club in Northern California. After you identify your station, we'll continue this excerpt from Alan's August 2021 audio video presentation. Radio for the rest of us. Our weekly on-air nets for our club and our club attendance itself, both online and in person, has doubled. We've had a lot of lapsed hams that have come out of the woodwork and said, hey, this radio program that you're doing in the community is really great. I want to be involved in it. I want to get involved in your club. Our membership is up. Our dues are up. And this is a direct result of these neighborhood radio watch programs. It is just amazing how this has generated more hams for us. And donations of money and equipment are way up, way up. So it has all those benefits to it, which we didn't really foresee. I hear a lot of hams say, you know, if we can just get the kids involved in ham radio, we can help ensure the future of our hobby. Well, I'm not so sure that we can do that very easily. I think it's better to first go after the parents and get them involved. Because if you get the parents involved, the kids are going to be there with them. And community radio programs are one way to do that. The parents get it. They understand community safety. They understand the risk of living in a high fire environment like we have here. And they're looking for alternatives. People firsthand have experienced these cell phones going down, and they know what that feels like when they're cut off. One of the worst things that could happen is we have the cell phone shut off and a fire breaks out, and people cannot get any emergency alert notifications about the fire. And if you're convinced that getting kids hooked on radio is a good way to grow our hobby and ensure its future, then it might help if you think of community radio programs as being a potential gateway drug, if you will, to ham radio in a good way. That's been our experience with many new hams first discovering community radio and then going on to get a ham radio license. What could be better than that? Thanks, everyone, for spending your time with me today. I'll be around for questions, and I'll be available for follow-up by email if you or your club are interested in learning more about how to start your own community radio program. And special thanks to Eric Guth, 4Z1UG, and for making this presentation possible, and to the wonderful staff and the sponsors who have helped put on this amazing virtual ham expo. I know I've gotten a lot out of it, and I hope you have too. There is a website. I'm going to post a couple up here. If you do Facebook, if you do a search on Neighborhood Radio Watch, you're going to pull up our Facebook group. we got about 250 people that are signed up for that. We also have resources that are on our club's website for the Neighborhood Radio Watch program. That's edcarc.net, edcarc.net. Dot net. Along the navigation on the top, you're going to see Neighborhood Radio Watch. And we have quite a few resources that are up there that cover the radios, some wow. of the training issues, and how to get a GMRS license, things like that. So you'll be able to find uh, quite a bit there. 
And then you can always follow up with me for more information about the program itself. Also, I've had some people already ask about whether I can do uh, presentations for other clubs on the program. That's perfectly fine. I'll be happy to uh, talk to you about uh, getting those set up. When we first started the program was back in around April of uh, 2019. Shortly after I had come back from working up in Paradise on the campfire, disaster recovery efforts there to help get T-Mobile's cell phone service back up and running. That pretty much turned me into an accidental advocate for fire safety and communication safety. And that's where the concept of this radio program came from. Since then, I probably have done, I'm going to guess, maybe 100 presentations online over the last two and a half years or so now. I'm happy to spread the word and see these programs grow elsewhere. Are there other clubs across the country that have done Neighborhood Radio Watch? Yes. Actually, if you search for RRI, that's Radio Relay International, they've got some information there. There is a club that is on the East Coast. There's other ones that spring up that don't get a lot of publicity. I talked to a couple of people yesterday during the other presentation. They've started some community radio programs in their area. There is one in the California, San Francisco Bay Area that operates regular nets every week. And they're concerned about fires too. They've had some terrible fires near Berkeley and Oakland and in the, in the foothills there. But they're also concerned about earthquakes. And they're concerned about losing communication services in an urban environment. So it's a different environment, different situation than what we face here in kind of more of a rural environment where we are in El Dorado County. I should mention right now that where I am sitting at this moment is in the Reno, Nevada Veterans Administration Office. The reason that I am here is that I had to come up and do some training with the folks here on a portable emergency satellite internet system that they're going to be taking up to Susanville about 100 miles north of here and setting up tomorrow morning. The reason that they are hauling that terminal up there is it's going up to one of the VA clinics is that they have lost internet and cell phone service in Plumas County and in Susanville specifically. They're the Dixie Fire, which you may have heard about, which is the largest fire now in California history, cut the fiber optic cable that was going up along the highway on 44 and cut off, severed the internet and severed the phone system because these cell phone towers need to have internet in order to function. And in a lot of places, they don't have any kind of backup that is viable and sustainable. So that's what I'm doing here. This is a case in point of where we have a community that is now cut off without communications, without centralized communications like internet and phone service. Do the radios have GMRS type acceptance? You know, uh, Bob Hess, who is the president of our club, he's also our radio maven and our architect here for the technical aspects of the program. These radios are out of public service. I don't know specifically that they are type certified for GMRS, but we are using them for GMRS. Because of the advantages that I mentioned in the presentation about the alert tone capability, the quick call to capability, and the fact that they don't have a lot of buttons on them makes them ideal for where we're going to be using them for. Also, we're actually talking now about getting a business radio license and switching everybody from GMRS over to business radio. It has a number of advantages because then people will not have to get an individual GMRS license. They'll just be enrolled under our business license umbrella. And also these same radios can be reprogrammed for business radio frequencies. All of our equipment is going to be forward compatible for that. There's also some issues with some potential interference. We've had occasional interference from the Sacramento Valley uh, getting up into our repeaters and vice versa. And so we want to make sure that we have kind of a protected system there and a clear channel for people to be able to communicate. How much do we charge for the radios? We charge at our cost. So we'll buy these radios. In some cases, we've gotten some of these TK380 Kenwood Handy Talkies out of public service through eBay. They flow out in the secondary market. So they might be a model that's two or three years old that has seen service with police, fire, sheriff, and then they just end up out on eBay. You know, they probably dump them out the back door in a big box and then somebody comes along, and scoops them up, and then we get them, sort through them, make sure that they're working okay. The first thing we do is put in new batteries because that's the number one thing that you're going to want to do on these. Don't even think about the battery that's in there being viable. Just go ahead and order a couple of new batteries for them. And then out the door, at cost, we charge $75, $85, $95, dollars place right in there just to cover the cost of acquiring those radios. You're still in the middle of our second excerpt from a forum talk by Alan Thompson, W6WN, Public Information Officer for the El Dorado County Amateur Radio Club in Northern California. This is RAIN, the Radio Amateur Information Network. 
how many radios are out there and how many folks check in on the weekly net? Great question. We've got about 300 radios that have been distributed and we've got more coming in and going out every week. We encourage everybody to get on these nets, but not everybody does. Some people will just listen to the net. And of course, we have no way of really knowing that. So we encourage people to get on there. I would say that out of that mix, we're getting about 50% of the people that actually check in on a weekly basis. And you might think of it like with a ham radio net. You may have 100 people, 200 people that are in a club, but how many actually check in during that weekly net? I guess it's a recruitment effort or a kind of a promotional effort on our part every week to call up and check on people. We've actually had some folks that we had somebody just follow up with them by cell phone or by email or even just walk next door if it's a neighbor and just check and see, is everything okay? Oh, uh, yeah, well, you know, I've been out of town for a while or, or the radio's not working or whatever it might be. So there is some support efforts that go on after they get these radios. And by the way, we make sure that uh, people have to get their GMRS license before we will hand them a radio. They need to at least make that commitment, make that much of an effort to get the radio. Otherwise, we won't sell them a radio. They've got to give us the license number. Not seeing anything about scanners on that site. Okay, scanners. If you look at the unit and scanners, they're the only ones that we're recommending right now that do the fire tone out feature. The one that I've got and a real popular one because of the price point is the BCT15X. If you shop around, you can find some deals. I think we just bought 10 of them for $150 each. And again, those go out at cost. We do this as a public service. People say, well, what's in it for you guys? Why are you doing this? It's community radio. This is a voluntary effort on our part here to help keep our community safer. Does it do real-time neighborhood watch reporting or is it only response to the fire tones? The fire tone out feature and the alert feature that's in the radio, these are two different things that are going on. The fire tone out feature allows people to have a scanner program for the different resources that are in their area, like police and fire, and the different fire departments issue these fire tone out commands. So somebody could have the radio on in the middle of the night, but they wouldn't be listening to a lot of chatter on there unless there was an alert sent by that fire station, and then that would wake up their radio. It's a safety measure. Instead of them hearing every police call or every sheriff's office call, or we even have channels for like animal control and things like that that are programmed into these scanners. So rather than listening to all that, it kind of keeps that quiet until they really need it. Kings Point Amateur Radio Club in Sun City Center does something very similar. Our concern is hurricanes. And that's the thing about this. I want to emphasize this. You know, in our area, it's fires. We right now, we had a fire that just broke out last night that is in the South County of El Dorado County. We've got two radio programs down there. And these are kind of restricted geographically because of the foothill environment that we're in. We don't cover like the whole county with one repeater. We have two repeaters down in that area. And there was a lot of chatter on there last night when this fire started up. And there is right now going on. I can't monitor honor from here, but it's there. And there's a lot of stuff that is going back and forth across our Groups IO sites. We also set up a Groups IO, Groups.io site for each one of these neighborhood radio watch programs so that people can sign into that and they can exchange information through there. So of course they need to have a computer or cell phone and they need to have internet service. But we also provide all of these other ancillary support mechanisms, if you will, to help support those radio programs. The radio programs actually got their start on the East Coast. And the reason why is because he saw these hurricanes coming in that knock all the cell phone towers down. And then there are no communications. It's not something we thought of. When I first got this idea when I was up in Paradise and we were rolling around in trucks and we have no communications up there other than a handful of FRS radios, just the cheap blister pack radios. That's when I started to think about this idea of what if just regular people had radios in their hands on the day of this fire? Could that have saved even one life? Even one life. So that's where we started from. And then when I started doing research, I found that there's a lot of different groups online that are in the country that are doing the same kinds of programs. I had mentioned that our donations have gone way up, specifically people donating money to help support the neighborhood radio watch program. So it's been a real surprise to us. We didn't expect to see that. It's helped the program immensely to have that financial support in there. Do we charge membership dues for the Neighborhood Radio Watch program? No, we do not. This is just a safety program for the general folks out there, and we don't want to set the barriers too high for them. It's enough of a barrier that they need to get a GMRS license. In some cases, we've given people radios. We've donated the radios. In some cases, we paid for their license fee 
it's on a case by case basis, and we'll make some exceptions. And in some cases, somebody will just have a couple of FRS radios, and they'll just say, "No, I'm fine with this. This is all I want to do." Now that I know that the radios I purchased last year for our camping trip already work with this program, I'm not interested in going any further. You know, we try not to be radio cops with this. We try not to put a lot of rules and regulations in place because that is going to scare people off. They just won't put up with it. We had a lot of people that came through and said, you know, this radio stuff is really interesting. Tell me more about what you guys do with ham radios. And then that opens a whole nother door for communications. But now they've had a chance to try it out, explore the system, get some idea of how it works. And then now they want to move on further. That was also a surprise. We didn't expect that when we started this program. It wasn't intended to do that. We started the program before we had the advisory boards. I think we recognized that we needed to have credibility in our area because we were getting some skepticism from some of the fire captains. And I think there's just a kind of a common thread that runs through、uh, first responders and emergency personnel that they're reluctant to give too much information to the community because they're worried that people are going to stampede. They're worried that if they say, "Okay, you know, we got a fire here, so we're going to roll some trucks out there," and you know, so everybody just kind of be on guard, that that's going to be enough to panic people into jumping into their cars and clogging up the roadways and making more problems for the first responders. There's a valid concern there, but I think it's pushed too far to the limit where they withhold information that is really important. That people just say, "Listen, just give me the information. If I know what's going on, I can make decisions to keep myself and my family safer." So we felt that the radio program helps bridge that. That gap, but we also recognize that the first responders and served agencies have this apprehension that we're just going to be a bunch of cowboys out there that are going to create problems for them by getting on the radio and gapping away out there and spreading nonsense. Our efforts to mitigate that meant that we started an advisory board. We've got first responders on that advisory board. We've got people who have come out of who have retired from public service. That understand things like emergency evacuations. They understand police and fire and sheriff's operations, and they, as a group, just basically put the stamp of these are guys are okay. They're doing things the way they should be doing. We even train people on ICS. So if you know ICS and and what goes on with those protocols, just the fact that we even know what ICS means goes a long ways to telling them. This is how we're doing things, folks. We are not doing social media here. We don't have people getting on there and saying, you know, I think that the situation with the forest is all messed up, and what are we going to do about it? And they start fighting those kinds of things. We don't allow that kind of stuff to go on. It's discouraged anyway. And that concludes our second Rain Hamcast podcast, giving you the nuts and bolts about the Neighborhood Watch program as it is being administered in El Dorado County, California, under the sponsorship. Of the El Dorado County Amateur Radio Club, this talk, radio for the rest of us, was given by Ellen Thompson, W6WN, Public Information Officer for the El Dorado County Amateur Radio Club in Northern California. Be advised, the FCC has reduced the cost of a GMRS license to thirty-five dollars for ten years. Old pieces of radio history that used to have a home in Highland County in the state of Virginia, USA, for several years, now rest in a West Virginia museum due to the efforts of the Highland Amateur Radio Association. The Times Gazette newspaper said that today most people take radio for granted as they've been able to listen to music and news like it's always been there. However, if you could go back before the turn of the century and turn on one of today's modern radios, all you would hear would be silence and static. It was only after the turn of the century that you might hear Morse code, dits and dars, then used to communicate because voice was not yet possible. It was not until Christmas Eve, 1906, in the USA, when Canadian Reginald Fessenden made the first transmission of voice and music over the airwaves. However, even if you knew Morse code and wanted to listen to the traffic between ships and their land stations, you couldn't go to an appliance store and purchase a radio receiver off the shelf, let alone a transmitter. If someone wanted to listen to this thing called wireless, they had to build their own receiver using things like wire, oatmeal boxes, pieces of coal, and telephonists' headphones. Often these items were assembled on a kitchen breadboard, a term that is still used today by those who build their own electronic projects. 
Even after pre-assembled radios became widely available, many experimenters still wanted to build ones of their own design. Thus, in most villages and towns, a radio store would not only sell these newfangled devices, but would make repairs and sell individual components and parts to those wishing to build their own receiver. Recently, Highland Amateur Radio Association member David Gunderman notified the club that his father, Robert, needed to relocate to a smaller residence and wanted to donate his early homebrewed radio equipment to an organisation that would not only honour those early radio pioneers but preserve the equipment he designed and built for future generations with an interest in early radio history to enjoy and appreciate. Thus, a different and challenging project was undertaken by the Highland County Club. A few years ago, the Highland County Historical Society found an old wooden cased radio in the Highland House Museum attic and contacted the Amateur Radio Club to find out more information about it. The club put out an inquiry to fellow amateur radio operators who collect antique radios and similar equipment. A ham in Switzerland referred them to Huntington's West Virginia Museum of Radio and Technology. Contact was made with the museum, and not only was information about the radio provided, it was built in Dayton, Ohio, by the way, but an offer to repair the radio to working condition was also made. And that response led to the West Virginia Museum being selected to receive the whole Gunderman collection. You can read the full article at www.timesgazette.com. Following a generous grant from Amateur Radio Digital Communications, the National Science Foundation's National Radio Astronomy Observatory will soon launch a two-year project to engage BIPOC and LGBTQIA plus students in learning about the electromagnetic spectrum and the excitement of amateur radio. The new project, Exploring the Electromagnetic Spectrum, is expected to offer its first student-facing trainings in January 2023. ARDC selected EMS because of National Radio Astronomy Observatory's proven track record in supporting underrepresented minority students in the sciences by combining mentoring and instruction from content experts with best practices in equity. As a part of National Radio Astronomy Observatory's broader impact focused supernova learning platform, EMS will combine the expertise of NRAO staff, amateur radio enthusiasts, and other subject matter experts to develop a scalable and shareable curriculum, introduce students to EMS and radio technologies through hands-on activities, and support students in attaining technical and general class licenses in amateur radio. Amateur radio provides a hands-on entry point to understanding the radio spectrum and its practical uses, including communications, astronomy, and community emergency infrastructure and response. Early support and engagement with amateur radio has the potential to create pathways for students to a future career or lifelong hobby in the sciences. The $315,123 ARDC grant will allow NRAO to develop and execute the program for two cohorts of students. It will also result in the development of a nine-month EMS curriculum that will be freely available to school groups community clubs, and educational institutions. The grant will also help to support its mission to serve minority students who are underrepresented in the sciences. Students will be introduced to radio technology and will work toward their technician and general class amateur radio licenses. National Radio Astronomy Observatory Director Tony Beasley said, Amateur radio continues to be incredibly important to the nation and global communications, and NRAO is excited to be working with ARDC to bring a new generation and diverse communities to the field. The amateur community in West Central Florida lost one of its regional leaders recently, Ben Henley, KI4IGX, the former Section Emergency Coordinator for the ARRL, became a silent key on July 20th. At the time of his death, Ben, who had congestive heart failure and ischemia, was awaiting a heart transplant. Though he made his living in the field of information technology,
he was deeply involved in his various emergency management roles that had amateur radio at its core. Many of his initiatives stemmed from his work as emergency management coordinator with Highlands County Emergency Management. He is credited for helping grow a partnership between that office and Highlands County Aries. He also helped build a bridge between three AWRL Florida Section Aries programs and the state's Emergency Operations Center for Emergency Response. Ben was 52 years old. Registration opens for NASA's 2022 International Space Apps Challenge. For more details on this year's event, we go to John Ross, KD8IDJ, who files this report. Built as the world's largest annual hackathon, the theme for this year's NASA International Space Apps Challenge is Make Space, celebrating the motto of there's always space for one more. Space App strives to eliminate barriers of access to space and science opportunities. The challenge will focus on Earth and space science, technology, and exploration. Participant registration for in-person and virtual events is now open through October 2nd of 2022. Space Apps provides an opportunity for everyone across the globe to use their passion for creativity, innovation, and unique perspectives to tackle challenges created by NASA experts. The challenges range in skill level, expertise, subject matter, and objective, and they span a spectrum of disciplines and interest, including artificial intelligence, software development, art, and storytelling. ARRL and amateur radio share several overlapping interests with NASA's objectives, including amateur satellite communications, amateur radio on the International Space Station, and STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics programs that interest young people in both space and radio communications. ARRL encourages radio amateurs to consider participating in NASA's Space Apps Challenge. Space Apps is managed by NASA's Earth Science Division in the agency's Science Mission Directorate at NASA headquarters in Washington. It is organized in collaboration with Booz Allen Hamilton, MindGrub, Second Muse, and NASA's Open Innovation Applied Sciences Program. For more information about Space Apps, and to register for an in-person or online event on October 1st and 2nd, 2022, visit NASA International Space Apps Challenge. Hackaday.com suggests that the lab at Ben-Gurion University, a research university in Israel, is the place where air-gapped computers go to die, or at least to give up their secrets. And this hack, using a computer's SATA cable as an antenna to intercept data, is another example of just how many side-channel attacks the typical PC makes available. The exploit, known as Satan, S-A-T-A-N, relies on the fact that the SATA 3 interface used in many computers has a bandwidth of 6 gigabits per second, meaning that manipulating the computer's I.O. would make it possible to transmit data from an air-gapped machine at around 6 gigahertz. It's a complicated exploit, of course, and involves placing a transmitter program on the target machine using the usual methods, such as phishing or zero-day techniques. But once in place, the transmitting program uses a combination of read and write operations on the SATA disk to generate radio frequency signals that encode the data to be extracted, with the data lines inside the SATA cable acting as antennae. It takes a while to transmit even just a few bytes of data, and the range is less than one meter, but that could be enough for the exploit to succeed. The interception setup could use a software-defined radio and a laptop, but you can easily imagine a much smaller package being built for a stealthy walk-by style attack. There is a potential countermeasure for Satan, which basically thrashes the hard drive to generate RF noise to mask any generated signals from the drive cable. While probably limited in its practical applications, Satan is nevertheless an interesting side-channel attack. From optical exfiltration using security cameras to turning power supplies into speakers, the vulnerabilities just keep on piling up. You can read the full story at hackaday.com, and we thank Stephen Walters, Golf 7 Victor Foxtrot Yankee, for this item. And finally this week, in Norway, motorists and others needing information about accidents, construction projects, and advisories on roads are now able to tap into a resource provided through amateur radio. The automatic packet reporting system map service operated by the Norwegian Radio Relay League. According to a report from the League, the Amateur Radio Map Service has integrated the data from the Norwegian Public Roads Administration into the APRS system. 
The messages are categorized according to levels of urgency, low, high, and highest. League members are able to get a user account, enabling them to do limited editing of map layers in the system. This week in Amateur Radio is holding open auditions for news anchors for the weekly national worldwide amateur radio news service. If you have a good radio voice and can reliably read provided news copy, we are looking for you. This, of course, is an all-volunteer position, and amateur radio license is not required. You must have a high-quality microphone, headset mics are not used, and be familiar with audio editing software to record and edit your finished news stories before uploading. If you would like to try out for a weekly or bi-weekly anchor position with North America's premier amateur radio news on air and podcast, please send an email to our producer, George, W2XBS. You can include a sample MP3 of yourself reading news copies sent as an attachment to W2XBS77 at gmail.com. That's whiskey, the number two, X-Ray Bravo Sierra 77 at gmail.com. Be sure and use Anchor Audition in the subject line. Please include your phone number and a good window of time for a callback to discuss your submission and our operating logistics to see if This Week in Amateur Radio is a good fit for you. We hope to hear from you soon. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters around the country and around the world on great repeater systems like WA3PBD repeater system, on Thursday evenings at 7.30 p.m. on 146.730 and 223.940, covering all of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and beyond. Many of the news and information items heard on this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the ARRL Audio News Service, and the ARRL Letter, the Southgate Amateur News Service, Steve Richards, G4 Hotel Papa Echo, and the Southgate Vibes News Service. AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain, and Ofcom. The South African Radio League, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, and the Australian Communications and Media Authority. The New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the Rain Hamcast, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG and QSO Today, QRZ.com, The Tech Guy, Leo Laporte, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. With special thanks to all our weekly news sources and to you, our listeners, that wraps up this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. If you would like to write to us, you can find everything you need, including archive editions of the news service at our website at twiar.net. And now for all of us at This Week in Amateur Radio headquarters and all our news team around the world, this is Will Rogers, K5WLR in Fayetteville, Arkansas,